praise you, Father, that you are our source. Man is not our source. Our job is not our source. Other people are not our source. We ourselves are not our source. You are our source. And so it is today that we submit to you every need that we have, no matter what that need is. We submit it to you, and we believe you, and we count on you, and we count it as having been done, that you will meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory, which are unsurpassed. We cannot even begin to think or imagine the riches that you have in glory by Christ Jesus. So Father, today we have come to worship and to praise you because we depend and count on you and you are always faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together and give the Lord some of the praise and honor and glory that he is worthy of. Amen. We encourage everyone to stand as long as you can for the Lord and, and just worship him. And by the way, it's perfectly all right to come up here in the front. Yeah. 
mercies for me every day. Your love never fails.
I just don't understand Must recount your faithfulness And the mercy of your hand When everything is said and done There's nothing left to say The cross of Christ is proof enough You are good You are good at your feet everything is said and done there's nothing left to say the cross of Christ is proof enough you are good you are good you are good
to be a friend of God. Oh, to be a friend of God. How sweet to be a friend of God. Oh, to be. the scripture our relationship with God is explained and exalted we go from being servants to being children we're the children of God amen we're his sons and his daughters and I always think of the story of the prodigal son as you're seated if people want to want to think about what God feels about me when I screw up what God thinks about me when I mess up my life. How many of you have ever been to that place where you messed it up? Even as believers, you messed it up. And the devil wants to tell us, well, God's mad at you. He's rejected you. You're no longer his child. Well, how could you have messed it up any more than the prodigal son? You know, he goes against every social custom and asks for his share of the inheritance. He So his father has to get all this money, borrow, sell, do whatever, so he can give this uh, one of only two sons, the younger son, share the inheritance. And then he goes off to a foreign country and he squanders it all in riotous living. And when he's lost it all, which is something the world never tells you, you can spend you can spend everything on the world, all the pleasure and all the enjoyment of the world, and all it will leave you is empty, broken, and in the pig pen. And he said, I, you know, no, no one gives me anything to eat. I have to eat the husk that we feed the pigs. And here I am, a, a Jewish boy, and I'm down here with the pigs. And so finally, it says he comes to his senses. And he says you know my father's slaves have it better than I do I'll go back and at least ask my father to receive me as a slave receive me as a servant and so he heads back and the scripture gives us the picture of God when we do that the father is scouring the horizon day after day looking for his lost son looking for his prodigal son and the scripture says that as that son approaches, the father recognizes him in his filthy rags and after a long journey, and the father runs to the son and embraces him. Now, he still smells of the world. He still smells of pig. If you've ever been around pig, you know, uh, you smell like pig, especially when you're around a bunch of them. And he still smells of the world. But the father embraces him. The father receives him. The father doesn't make him a servant. He says, I've sinned against you and God, Father, I only deserve to be a, a servant. And his father says, you know, bring sandals for my son's feet. Bring the signet ring for my son's hand, signifying that he was uh, his son again. He probably sold his uh, earlier ring and kill the fatted calf we're going to celebrate because my son that was lost has returned give the lord some praise amen that's how god feels about us it's the devil who wants to tell us oh if you come back to god you're not going to be anything you can only be a slave you can only be a servant no god says you come back to me you're going to be a son amen you're going to be a son and we end that song with being a friend of God. And I, I looked up friend of the king, especially in the Old Testament times. And it was a very honored relationship. Kings uh, in the Middle East were absolute monarchs. Their own wives didn't come to see them without uh, an appointment or without being, uh, the king being asked by a, uh, his chamberlain if the wife could enter his presence. 
know, they were displeased with their wives, like the one king that got rid of his wife for uh, bad-mouthing him. I, I'm not going to say what I'm thinking. I'm going to rebuke that thought. <laughs> got rid of his wife for bad-mouthing him and, and immediately ordered a beauty contest for another wife. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, the friend of a king was a special position. And the friend of a king could enter into the king's presence at any time without prior permission. He could, it was an honored position. It was actually a position that people knew they held. And it meant they could go into the king's throne room and speak without being announced or without permission being asked. And the Bible, as it continues to explain our position in God, says that Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friend. We are friends of the king. Are you guys doing lemonade here today or someplace else? Okay, you did it here last year, but... All right, praise the Lord. Go buy some lemonade day, support the kids. All right, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have um, Roy back there pass around the green and red. We haven't done this for a while. I keep forgetting, but uh, I appreciate Abby and Carl. I appreciate Carl's hard head. <laughs> he got hit in the head. But... Uh, like us preachers, he has a hard head. Preachers have to have hard heads. Be careful, you may be called. <laughs> yeah, but uh, they're bringing all kinds of people to Thursday church. They're inviting all kinds of people. Carl's mother's been to Thursday church several times. Uh, Abby uh, got her mom there, right? And uh, they've brought friends there and everything else. You know, folks, this is one of the things that the scripture says, I, I need my Bible, my sword's out in the car, that's always bad. Paul talks about the sowing and the reaping, and he says one sows and another reaps, but he says they both receive a reward. The devil tells you that it does you no good to invite people if they don't come. He's lying to you. God will reward you for sowing. God will bless you for just sowing. Get out there and sow seed. Get out there and invite others to come. And again, he who sows sparingly is going to reap how? Sparingly. He who sows bountifully is going to reap how? Bountifully. So what we have been doing, we have been encouraging people to take a red and a green square. If you have invited somebody to church this week when the offering's passed, you put a green square in and keep the red to remind you, don't stop. Okay? If you have not invited anybody to church this week, you put the red one in the offering and you keep the green to remind you to go and make disciples. Amen? Go and invite somebody to church. Now, that includes your relatives that aren't here. Look around, and, and nobody will have an impact on family if they're not here. The pastor will have some impact, but you have more impact. Amen? So we got a lot of people out. Some people are preparing for the uh, senior fellowship and the fellowship at, that we're having. But put a red or green in. Most Sundays that we remember to emphasize this, we've been doing extremely well. We've been averaging 60% of our people inviting people to church. I'll put that up against almost any church anywhere. 60% of you. So give the Lord some praise. Amen. But you know, it's not complicated. It's just, you know, uh, tell somebody about your church and invite them to church. Tell somebody about Thursday church. Back there in the back, with the one with the handicapped person on the cover, we have these articles about Thursday church. Uh, this is an uh, enabled servant. It's the enabled servant cover. Uh, you can take this and the whole magazine and use that article, Thursday Church, to show somebody, have them read a little bit about it, and encourage them to come to Thursday Church. Amen? So I encourage you to do that. All right, let's get our ushers up. We're going to take up our tithes and offerings.
Yeah, Ben's going to go play for, who are you playing for? Brother Dangerfield. So I guess you're doing a guitar invitation. <laughs> we'll have a drum guitar invitation or something. I don't know. <laughs> we will be taking up a love offering uh, in a little bit. And I explained last week, or an offering. It's not really a love offering. You're not telling me you love me. <laughs> I'm required by the Indiana State, Sharon says that's very convenient, that I always mention I'm required to go, but if you look up the Constitution and bylaws, which she says, of course, we are always diligent to observe every jot and diddle, but <laughs> our state has a meeting every year uh, that's a business meeting, and actually all licensed and ordained ministers within the state are required to attend last about two days, two and a half days, and this is in Terre Haute. So uh, that's hotel room, transportation, and, and gas, and meals for two days. So after we take up our tithes and offerings, we're going to take up a love offering, and uh, that's all going to go to help offset the cost of, of traveling all the way across the state and spend, spending two days in something a little better than a Motel 6, I hope. Sometimes I wait, and I, I always, I, I'm frugal. I take the coupons and go to three or four places to try to get the cheapest price. <laughs> Amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. This is our regular tithes and offerings. Lift them to the Lord and give in faith. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as we lift our tithes and our offerings to you, Lord, we claim the promises of Scripture. You have said that you will rebuke the devourer. You have said, Lord, that you will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon your people that cannot be contained. And so, Lord God, we thank you for that in Jesus' precious name. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. All right, pass those out. Remember to put either a green or a red. If you've invited somebody to church, not for the first time, you call somebody that's been absent. Call a friend or relative that ain't here and say, call Vicky on vacation and say, why ain't you in church? <laughs> say, come back. All right. Now I need, Sharon, I want you to look up the end of Luke's gospel for me. <laughs> Daniel, will you help pass out this outline? When you get it, I expect to hear <gasps> gas for air and things like that. And I want to welcome, if Ben is taping, is Ben got this on Ustream? All right. Well, I know we've got at least one person watching by Ustream because somebody could not come today, and he texted me, uh, Bobby Atwell, and said, I will be watching on Ustream or on computer. So everybody turn around to the camera and say, hi, Bobby. Hi. <laughs> so if you miss and you tell us you're going to watch, we'll turn around and greet you until the numbers get so high. I was brought up and raised uh, Southern Baptist. I had never uh, heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'd never heard about speaking in tongues. I'd never heard about any of those things at all. We did have an older woman in our church uh, who would stand up every once in a long while and give a tongue. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, <laughs> she would start speaking in a language that no one understood. <laughs> And, well, you know, we speak all these secret languages like give a tongue, and some of you are sitting out there going, what is that? What is give a tongue? You know, we never think how <laughs> she didn't slice her tongue off and lay it at the altar. That's not what she did. She, <laughs> she spoke, <laughs> she spoke in, in a f language that no one understood. And because she was one of the mothers of the church, she was like mother to a couple of the chief deacons, and she was, uh, you know, she was up there. She probably in her 80s. Seven, well, she, you know, I'm a young kid. She might have been 60. <laughs> when you're young, that seems old. 
But uh, she would stand up and, and speak in a, a language that no one understood. And there wasn't anybody there to interpret this in a Pentecostal church. So when she's done, she'd kind of lose gas and sit down. And the preacher would just go right on. If she started in the middle of his sermon, he'd stop, let her do it. You know, that was, that was it. That was my total experience with anything charismatic or Pentecostal. And uh, that didn't do much to impress me. I didn't even understand what the heck was going on. And, and no one, no attempt was ever made to explain it. But I'm a senior in high school, getting ready to go into my senior year, and one of my best friends since the eighth grade, he and I pout around together quite a bit, and we were your typical teenage boys. You know, your typical teenage boys. I don't have to go into much detail if you've got, ever had teenage boys. Uh, you know, <laughs> I was your typical teenage boy. And um, so was he. And all of a sudden, he began to change. Dramatically. He stopped swearing. He stopped uh, telling dirty jokes. He stopped uh, all the stuff that teenage boys do. He just kind of stopped it. And I thought to myself, well, what in the heck is going on with uh, my friend Mark? I wondered if uh, invasions of the body snatchers had happened. You know, has somebody come in and cloned him, taken over his body? You know, who is this guy? I, I don't recognize him. And Mark had attended a Disciples of Christ church, which today is a pretty liberal denomination. And that church had somehow been exposed to the charismatic movement and the word of faith movement. And many people in that church had experienced what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, including my friend Mark. And it had so noticeably changed him that, uh, that I, could, I couldn't believe it. And I uh, asked him what was going on, and he told me, and of course I didn't understand what the heck he was talking about. He said, you know, well, we have, uh, we've received the Holy Spirit. Well, my preacher talked a lot about being Spirit-filled and about having the Holy Spirit. So when he tried to tell me that I didn't have the Spirit, I was a little mad. You know, what do you mean I don't have the Spirit, you know? And, and he did, really didn't know a lot to explain. So I got my Good News for Modern Man Bible, the one with the little stick figures. How many of you remember that one? I loved that little Bible. And I went through that Good News for a Modern Man Bible, through the Gospels and through Acts, and I began to discover for myself that there was something more. That there was another experience with God's Spirit. That my church wasn't teaching that very few people in my church knew anything about. And Mark wasn't much help in explaining it. But, uh, and that's one of the things I've long felt. That's one of the reasons for this sermon. I want you, if you are someone who has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want you be, to be able to explain to others, you know, the sequence and what it is. And if you haven't, I want you to see clearly in the Scripture that the Bible clearly says there is a, another experience that we are to have with God's Holy Spirit. So, I found it in the Word and I started praying and, and uh, my family had moved me to the basement because I almost killed my brother sharing a room with him. That's how much of a teenager I was. Dad put me in the basement. I wasn't shackled to the wall or locked in or anything like that, but I was forced to live in the basement. And so, and so uh, you know, one night, on the third night, I'm wearing flannel pajamas, T-shirt, underwear. I'm wearing a heavy overcoat because it is a basement, and it is the fall of the year. It's like 55 degrees down there because my dad didn't believe in turning the heat on until Mom yelled at him. <laughs> so I'm down there praying. And I asked the Lord, you know, if there's something to this, I want you to baptize me in the Holy Spirit. I want you to fill me with your spirit. And all of a sudden, I began to feel just warmth begin to pour over me, first pour over me, and then begin to radiate out from me. And before too long, I couldn't keep my, 
robe on. I had to take it off. And then I had to take my flannel pajama top off. And I even had to pull my T-shirt off. And, and, I mean, God was all over me. And I'd been saved when I was about 10 years old, 11 years old. And now this is, uh, I'm now 18, 19 years old. I think I was 18. And now I've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that literally transformed my life. I am without a question here today because I received that experience. Amen? And that's the only reason. All right, I'm going to ask our ushers to come up and receive that love offering and get the first scripture ready as they come. You are helping send your representative to the district council meeting where we vote on officers and from time to time entertain motions. As a matter of fact, general council's coming up in August and a lot of the state councils send motions to the general council. It's only biannually. And that affects uh, our entire movement, our entire denomination. So uh, where are you guys taking the offering? Are you keeping it? You need to separate it. Okay, make sure because we've got to take it to the back. And make sure this stays separate from it. But we vote on issues. We vote on officers. We've got some executive officers to vote on this very time. And if anybody wanted to go with me, uh, you can go as a delegate. So uh, let me know if you do. Father, we thank you for the, the, the fellowship that we're a part of. There's a liberty and a freedom in the assemblies of God that few denominations enjoy. Lord, I thank you that we are a sovereignly independent church. That, God, we're part of a cooperative fellowship, but we're not coerced or forced into anything. Father, we, the people of this church, own this building and have given it to your service. No one else owns it. Father, we, the people of this church, determine God's will for our church and for our future. No one else dictates to us what that future will be. Father, we, I determine what is preached from this pulpit as I feel your leading. No one tells me I must preach this this Sunday and that next Sunday. No one but the Lord... Father, I thank you that we're a part of a fellowship that enjoys such liberty and such freedom. And a fellowship, Lord God, that is transforming the entire world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys start. I'm proud to be a part of the Assemblies of God. Many people do not know this. You are a part of, as a member of the Assemblies of God, the largest Protestant fellowship in the world. The largest Protestant fellowship in the world. Missionologists estimate our adherents worldwide are now approaching 100 million. We are over 84 million is our count. A lot of missionologists say we count too low. Some of our uh, national districts only count men count women and children because of their heritages. And so uh, uh, others say we're, we're now at close to 96 million and we're, we will be breaking the 100 million mark any day. Folks, that's the fellowship you're part of. Amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise. That is awesome. God is using our, our fellowship to reach the world. And, and that freedom and liberty that the Assemblies of God enjoys that I explained to you is one of the reasons why the Lord led me here, having been raised a Baptist, that's what I was used to. And uh, that same liberty and freedom is what causes our explosive growth worldwide. Because, see, the, the Assemblies of God in Kenya is sovereign. Uh, it, the Americans don't dictate to the Assemblies of God in Kenya what they are to do. They have their own national uh, headquarters. They have their own national leader. And every Assembly of God church in Kenya is sovereign. The Assemblies of God church in Brazil is sovereign. Uh, they're not told what to do. They're not ran by some foreign power, uh, which is part of how they would view us. And that model has worked extremely well for our churches. Amen. 
And our missionaries don't go over to be the pastors and senior leaders of congregations. They go over to train pastors and senior leaders of congregation. And so instead of one man having a congregation even of 10,000, uh, one man will prepare a 1,000 ministers, and they'll go out and be uh, pastors of tens of thousands of people. Amen? Come on, give the Lord some praise. So thank you, because... This will be used to get me there and to vote on our leadership and continue our tradition of freedom. Let's look at the scripture. Number, the first thing I want you to know is that all born-again believers have received the Holy Spirit. They have all received the Holy Spirit. There is no one who is born again who does not have the Spirit of God residing in them. The scripture says you can't even call Jesus Lord without the Spirit of God. Call him Lord and mean it. You know, you give a drunk a a buck and he'll call Jesus anything you want him to. But he can't mean it except by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And there's a very important sequence uh, that needs to be noticed. This is the evening of Resurrection Day. And you can find this clearly in John's Gospel. This is the evening of Resurrection Day. Sunday, Easter, Sunday evening. And the Scripture says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be with you. Go to the next one. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and side. Then his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now let me stop right here. We'll do a little side note. Jesus rose on what day of the week? The first day. Look at your calendars. What's the first day of the week? Sunday. I know a lot of us think it's Monday. (laughs) But it's Sunday. Sunday. And a lot of people get caught up in Sabbath laws. And they think you got to go to church on Sunday. You got to, you know, you got to worship on Sunday. It's the Sabbath. And there are people out there who think you're breaking God's commandments by being here today instead of yesterday. Well, what they don't realize is Jesus said in addressing the Sabbath laws, he says the Sabbath was not made for God, it was made for man. And it's primarily a law that we should take a day off every once in a while. Actually, once a week. It's a law that God's saying, you need to rest, dummy. Amen? You need to rest at least one day a week. A lot of you are Sabbath breakers. Some of you feel like you have to be Sabbath breakers. I understand that with our hectic lives. But God is saying, you really ought to try to work real hard at having a Sabbath. Amen? It's important. Now, if you're the mother of three, there ain't no such thing as the Sabbath. (laughs) Unless somebody takes them kids for you. But uh, we honor, we gather on the Lord's Day. And Sunday became called the Lord's Day when Jesus resurrected. Amen? Amen? And there's numerous scripture on that. Paul talks about the believers gathering on the first day of the week. The collection being taken on the first day of the week. There is no evidence in scripture that any Christian congregations except Messianic ones worshipped any other day than Sunday. So Sunday, the Lord's Day, has replaced the Sabbath law for worship. The Sabbath is for rest. And God initiated that law for rest. Sunday is the Lord's day. Amen? Turn to somebody and say, I'm glad you're here on the Lord's day. You got a Dusty, tell him you're glad he's here on the Lord's day. <laughs> All right, so that's a little side note that was free. It's such a short sermon, I got to chase a few rabbits. <laughs> Let's go on. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he did what? Breathed on them. 
He didn't breathe on one of them, so he took a pretty big breath. He breathed on all of them and said, what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what has just happened is they have been born again. They have been born again. Because you cannot be born again. It is a function of the Holy Spirit. You can't be born again without the Holy Spirit. You know, you can have somebody repeat a prayer like a parrot all day long, you know. They had this disco parrot on the, seven, on the, uh, the, the uh, morning show. This, th- this parrot sings disco. And he, and he also says, nobody ba- backs baby in a corner. Some of you remember where that was from. <laughs> Can you imagine a parrot saying that? Nobody backs baby in a corner. But uh, you can teach a parrot to say a salvation prayer and it ain't saved. You can have somebody repeat a salvation prayer, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't come upon them, if the Holy Spirit doesn't do an operation, a spiritual operation on them, all they have done is spoken a prayer. The Spirit comes, and you know that there has been a change. You have been changed. Now, what day is this? Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Now go to John 3, 3 through 7. And I could give you dozens of scriptures about being born again that show you the Holy Spirit. It says in 1 Corinthians that uh, we are not to join our bodies to that of a harlot because do we not know that our bodies are the temple of God because we are one spirit with the Lord. Because the, the, when the Holy Spirit comes for uh, being born again, he enters us and joins our spirit. Jesus answered and said to him, this is a conversation with Nicodemus that most of us know, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Good question, Nicodemus. The answer, most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, what what happens in all human births? The water breaks. It may possibly be baptism, a veiled reference to baptism, but uh, I think it's most likely when we're born, there's water. Amen? Amen. If there's no water, you weren't born alive. And so he says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the... He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is... And that which is born of spirit is... Spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. So... Jesus has risen from the dead. The disciples are the first group of people to be born again. Amen? That makes sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you. Those are the guys he trained and prepared for three years to to do it. And in that instance, they were born again. Remember Thomas? Thomas goes, uh, Thomas wasn't there in that John story. And they tell Thomas... They say, uh, you know, the Lord is risen, the Lord is risen. And Thomas says, I'm not going to believe unless I see. I'm not going to believe unless I put my uh, fingers in his nail-scarred hands. I'm not going to believe. And Jesus appears several days later to Thomas. And the moment he does, Thomas doesn't put any hands anywhere. He falls to his knees and he says, my Lord And my God. Because the moment Thomas saw him, the Holy Spirit breathed upon him. No one can say Jesus is the Lord except by the Spirit. Thomas was born again in that instant. All right. Go to the next one. Now we are commanded to wait for the promise of the Father, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Sharon, are you at 
uh, Luke's Gospel. Bring me Luke's Gospel. I didn't add that, but if you've got pens and you want to add this to your note, because Luke's Gospel makes it plain too. I'm going to have to buy you one of those Bibles. She's, she's, she's gotten in the habit of using one of my favorite Bibles. <laughs> Do what? It's uh, obviously Christmas is coming. You know, your birthday's coming. I see a Bible in your future. That's a prophecy. <laughs> uh, verse 44 of the very last uh, of Luke's gospel. And he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. When Jesus hung on the cross and he said, It is finished, that term also means it is fulfilled, it is done. And the law and the, the, the requirements of the law were satisfied in Messiah. Amen. Amen. You don't have to keep the law. Amen? I don't know about you, I'm glad. I enjoy bacon. I had some just the other day. I enjoy lobster. It may be the roach of the sea, but give me all the roach of the sea I can eat. You know, I, I don't mind a little piggy. I, I like eating pork. And, and I, how many of you enjoy a cheeseburger every now and then? Well, you just broke the law. You know, you can't eat a cheeseburger and on and on and on the list goes. Most of you are breaking the law with just your clothing today. You can't wear two different types of material woven in two different ways or something like that. And how many have ever bought, sold, or traded a dog? Anybody ever bought a dog, sold, or traded a dog? You broke the law. Amen. Jesus fulfilled the law. Thank God we're free from the law. Come on, give the Lord some praise. So Jesus tells them it's all been fulfilled in me. Not just the prophecies about who he is, the Messiah. You've got to understand what the Messiah was. The Messiah was the fulfillment of all God's righteous requirements. And it says in verse 45, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, to suffer and to be raised from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Now I want you to see. This is ascension day. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endowed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass when he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So here we have Jesus on the day of ascension saying, Tarry in Jerusalem until you are endowed with power from on high. He's saying, boys, you're saved but you need more. You're saved, but you need more. Why? Because of the work he had for them to do. All right, go to the next scripture. Acts 1. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they watched him, he was taken up in a cloud and received out of their sight. Amen? What day was that? That was uh, Ascension Day. And I don't know why I didn't put those first scriptures in there, but if you got your Bibles in Acts 1, I want you to see these scriptures too. 
Jesus commands us to wait. One of the most impressive things I ever saw on the 700 Club years ago when Ben Kinchlow was still uh, a co-host and all these other things, I saw a missionary, I think he was Presbyterian, from uh, Africa. Brother Erickson will appreciate this. And he and his brother had gone to Africa as missionaries, as young men. They were now in their 50s or 60s. And he said, we labored in Africa for three or four decades, 30, 40 years. He said, my brother and I labored in Africa for, uh, for 40 years. That's 80 years between the two of them. He said, you could count on two hands the number of converts that we had made. Count on two hands the number of converts they had made. And he said, we returned to America on sabbatical, first my brother and then I, and my brother attended a charismatic Presbyterian church where they taught that we need more than to just be saved, more than just to be elected if you're Presbyterian. We need to be endowed with power from on high. And he said, my brother, hands were laid on him, And he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said when he came back to Africa, his ministry exploded. Amen? Then he said, my brother was so changed, it was now time for me to go on sabbatical. So I came to America. I went to a charismatic Presbyterian church. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then they showed a video. He said, I want you to see this video from Africa. And there was this video of this church larger than this, probably twice this size. And on the worship stand were all these men, and, and this one guy was just going crazy leading worship. Africans are very enthusiastic in their worship. Amen? <laughs> very enthusiastic in their worship. And uh, <clears throat> Ben Kishlow noticed that everybody was a man, and most of them were wearing ties. And he said, well, where are the women? And he says, oh, this is a pastor's conference. This is just the pastors who have gotten saved and come into the ministry since we have returned filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Thousands! I want to tell you something. Daniel and Danielle, you guys are going to be missionaries. And what the Lord wants you to know is do not rely on the arms of the flesh or the programs, but get back to the power. Rely on the power of the Holy Spirit when you go over there. We have forgotten in our charismatic Pentecostal churches, the power of God. We have forgotten the power of God. It's the power of God that changes. It's the power of God that sets the drug addict free. It's the power of God that can take an alcoholic and in one day make him sober. It's the power of God that can take a heroin addict and remove every single addiction and symptom from his heroin addiction. Science can't do that. Man can't do that. But God's power can do that. Amen? God's power can do that. It is time for us to get back to the power of God in our churches and realize that it's not the arm of the flesh. It is the power of God. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. He tells them to remain in Jerusalem until they are endowed with power. And he has already been with them for 40 days. And the verses that I didn't put up there uh, are verse 4, Acts 1-4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them. Everybody say commanded. Not to depart from Jerusalem. 
but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized. Everybody say baptized. With the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So Jesus said, you're saved, but you need to be baptized. Amen? You're saved, but you need to be baptized. And this clearly, the first incident clearly happens on Resurrection Day. The second incident clearly happens on Ascension Day. And there's more than one source of Scripture to verify this. These are not the same events as some would try to pretend. Some have suggested who try to say there is no second experience with the Spirit that what happened in John was actually just another way of telling what happened on the day of Pentecost. It can't be, or the Scripture lied. It's a totally different event. It's a totally different day. It's, it's a totally different uh, chron chronological order. It can't be the same. As a matter of fact, if you go to... Did I even put Acts 2 in this? Yes, I did, but let's go on. All the Scriptures... Part of the confusion is this. The Scriptures uh, use some of the same terms for two different events. You know, Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, but yet the baptism is often referred to as receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, and there are places where salvation is talked uh, and the Spirit are talked in such a way that it's easily confusable with um, the baptism. But I like this little illustration. I'm trying to find a place to put my water. It's a clear glass. I probably needed a colored one. But everybody see the glass? Now, if this water represents the Holy Spirit, this is being saved. God pours His Spirit into you. Primarily into your spirit. It does a whole operation when it's there that I've shared before. It cuts away at your spirit, that part of your spirit which was fallen. It's called the circumcision of the heart. And then you got half a spirit. So the Holy Spirit literally joins your spirit and becomes one spirit with you. That's why the Bible says that which is born of God cannot sin. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever read that and thought, whoop, I'm in trouble. Because I think I'm born of God, but yet I pretty much know I sin. Anybody else there? Well, when you understand that that which is born of God is the Spirit, then you understand that never again will sin originate in the Spirit or the heart of a born-again person. Amen? That which is born of God, Jesus said that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of God, because the Spirit is God, is Spirit. So never again will sin originate in your heart. Amen? And that means that sin never comes from there again. Let's look at Acts 2, verse 1 through 4. I've taken longer than I thought I would. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that's why they call us Pentecostals. Where we get that name? It comes from this. It comes from the fact that the outpouring of the baptism, which is a cardinal doctrine of our beliefs, that we need that second endowment of power, that that event happened on the day of Pentecost. That's why we're called Pentecostals. And it goes on and it says... When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled in one accord, with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were what? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is why we believe that, I believe, I word it slightly different from the assembly, I believe that anyone who has been baptized in the Holy Spirit has the ability to speak in tongues. Now, fear may keep you from doing it. Not understanding may keep you from doing it. You know, lots of people, we pray for them, 
And it's obvious that the Spirit came upon them, but they don't speak in tongues. Uh, but they go home three days later, and in the shower, suddenly they're going, Eat, Ben I mean, it just suddenly hits them. I know people who have woke up in the middle of the night speaking in tongue. Amen? Because you have that ability when you receive this. And this is not a tongues teaching lesson. I did that for, what, nine weeks, Harriet? <laughs> I did that for nine weeks. Because it is a complicated subject. It is not an easily understood thing. But it's a precious gift. But we're not here to talk about tongues. We're here to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, one year I had Ben bring all kinds of power tools up here. I didn't do that this year. Now, I can have... I was back there uh, the other day screwing in all of the loose chairs in the fellowship hall. And by the, I thought my hand would be much sore than it is today. But apparently I use my hand a lot. <laughs> so it wasn't nearly as sore as I thought it would be. <laughs> so I'm there uh, putting all those chairs in, and it dawned on me, man, it would have been nice, Charlie, to have had a power tool. I could have just gone zip, 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 zip. I'd have done, done those in no time. Okay? If you don't have the power tool, you have to use your own power. How many of you have ever used one year? <laughs> Richard will love this. One year I decided to be brilliant, save money. I bought a push mower. The blade push mower. No engine. I don't even know to this day what happened to that sorry thing. Oh, gave it to Anna. <laughs> I think I might have used it. Well, gave it to my daughter. Smart idea. <laughs> I might have used it once, and I decided, man, this, I didn't use it at all. <laughs> I remember pushing it a little bit. <laughs> I at least tried it out. <laughs> she cuts the grass anyway. <laughs> But what I want you to know is this. There's a, how many of you have ever used one of those things? That was invented in hell. <laughs> how many of you would much rather fill that, fill that thing up with gas and, and pull back that thing and zip through that yard? Amen? Say, everything is better with power. One more time. Everything is better with power. You women remember when you had to use the hand blender? The hand mixer? Yeah, or ringer washers or any of those, or hang all your wash out to dry. Yeah, how many of you would like to have walked to church or gotten in a horse and buggy to have gotten here? And even if you get in a horse and buggy, you're relying on power. You can get here on your own two feet. You got here on horsepower. Amen. Now this is what I want you to know. God said, everything is better with power. You know, you need power. And the power comes from the Holy Spirit. Come on, give the Lord some praise. The power comes from the Holy Spirit. The chief difference is this. Being born again or receiving the Spirit in that fashion is primarily an inward event. It is primarily for you as an individual. It changes you. It cleans you up. It makes you right with God. Amen? But you still don't have the degree of power that the Lord wants you to have, especially the power to minister to others. My friend was born again, but he was still just like me. I was born again, but I was still just like him. But when he received the power of the Holy Spirit, his life was transformed. And I noticed that when I received the power of the Spirit, my life was transformed. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, or receiving the Spirit in that fashion, is primarily an outward event. That's why God gives the witness of tongues and other manifestations. It is primarily given to the benefit of others. Now, that's another problem we've got in Pentecost. We enjoy the power for ourselves. Let the whole neighborhood use the push mower. I got the only power mower in town and I'm keeping it for me. 
You know, uh, let the whole neighborhood walk everywhere they go. I got the only car in town, and I ain't giving you a rock. You know, let the whole neighborhood hang out their laundry. I've got the only dryer in town, and I ain't a-sharing it. When we've got the power, we hog the power. Instead of realizing that God's whole intention of giving it to us is for us to use it to minister to others. You have more power at your disposal than you ever dreamed of. You don't have to drag somebody to Ziggy's revival to be healed. The Bible says you are to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You don't have to uh, drag somebody to a revival to get a word from God. If you believe, God will give you the word for the person needs to hear from the Lord. Amen. We have the power. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is more like this. When we receive the Spirit in salvation, it's like water being poured into a glass. When we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is like the glass being immersed in the water. Completely covered. I was brought up and raised Baptist, so I know what baptism means in the Greek. It does not mean to be sprinkled. It does not mean to be poured. The Greek word is baptismo, and it means to be totally immersed. God pours the Holy Spirit into us when we're born again. God pours the Holy Spirit upon us and completely immerses us in the presence of the Spirit when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. But this is another mistake that Pentecostals think. We think that once that happens, we are somehow an inexhaustible source of power ourselves. We think that, you know, God poured his power out on me. I felt the Holy Spirit. It really touched me. Now the work is done. And we don't realize that Scripture clearly shows even the apostles getting subsequent refillings of the Holy Spirit. The other mistake we as Pentecostals make, you need to look at your life and say, do I have evidence of the power of God in my life and all around? If I don't, I need to get refilled. Come on, give the Lord some praise. I need to get refilled. You know, is there no joy in your life? You need refilled. Is there no victory in your life? You need refilled. Is there no power in your life? You need refilled. Is there no desire to read God's Word, pray and worship in your life? You need to be refilled. When you come upon others, do they say to you, there is something different about you? Are you using a different makeup? Are you using a... That's for the women. (laughs) Carl wouldn't use it. (laughs) Are you using a different... You know, they tell Carl, you using a different hair, uh, you know, gel or whatever. He probably don't use any of that either. (laughs) Shampoo. I'll get it right in a minute, Carl. (laughs) And... uh, people will notice a difference. If people have stopped noticing any difference, you need to get refilled. Until people begin to say to you, what has happened? Who are you? You know, did the pods come? I mean, what what happened? You're a different person. Amen? Then we we don't have to try to be different. We don't have to try to be peculiar. We don't have to try to stand out. We don't have to try to move in God's power. As a kid once, it's a miracle I'm alive. But, uh, you know, rabbit ears in uh, television sets. You guys remember rabbit ears? Who all remembers rabbit ears? You guys? And so my grandparents had some loose rabbit ears. And I don't know why I even did this. I stuck the ends of the loose rabbit ears into the antenna, Sharon. They went, (laughs) 
And so I stuck the end of the loose rabbit ears into a socket, and then I grabbed a hold of the rabbit ears. I felt some power. <laughs> I felt some power. Amen. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. When the power of God comes upon you, you know it. You feel it. You know it's happened. And uh, it's not a, well, I wonder. No. If the baptism is genuine, if the move of God is genuine in your life, you know it. You experience it. Let's stand together. So much for, see, Drew, a short outline does not necessarily mean a short sermon. How many of you, does that help you understand? By the way, how many of you notice, can you even see the glass anymore? I mean, the glass for most of you has completely vanished. All you now see is the water. Part of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens is that they stop seeing you and they start seeing Jesus. They stop seeing you and they start seeing the Spirit. They stop seeing you because you, you have vanished. You've been absorbed in God. Amen. God's saying, stay absorbed in me. That's how we overcome sin. You know, when we get weak in the Spirit, sin easily besets us. And, and can take over any of us. But when we say fill with the Spirit, let me tell you, demons run from Spirit-filled people. They are afraid of us. Sin runs from Spirit-filled people. The devil's so dumb, sometimes I laugh out loud at him. He throws some temptation my way, and I just start belly laughing. I go, you are dumber than I thought you were. Amen? You can only do that when you're filled with the Spirit. This altar's open. Hallelujah. I want you to come. If you want to ask God for a refilling, I want you to come. We don't have a lot of instruments. We don't have a lot of music, but that's all right. We're going to get a little guitar playing maybe in a minute, or did you come forward for that refilling? You can do both. <laughs> Grab a guitar.